I want to check that everybody's able to hear the audio. Is it fine for everyone? Is anyone having issues uh, understanding or does it sound fine? If you don't, just let me know. Raise your hand. Okay, everybody's good. Um, please go ahead, Kaveh. Great, thanks. So um, later on, uh, when you know, in the early 2000s, we started working in, in larger enterprises, this situation was different, where before we owned the entire process, now we were just a, a, a small team. Uh, somebody had built the solution. Um, our team and uh, a whole bunch of others actually had to um, work together on this project. So there was a large amount of technical debt. Uh, the, the application was very old and legacy with many problems. Um, and, the, and the teams that we had to work with, they were in different silos. So you had the Windows team, you had the Unix team, you had the database team, the dev team, which, of which we were a part of, and the prod team. And trying to do anything together required a great deal of coordination to, to get things done. And uh, acquiring, uh, getting security budget to actually uh, fix the problem, the technical debt that we had was very challenging because uh, the business was very reluctant to, to release um, you know, money and, and time to, to do those things. And, and the real lesson uh, from, from that um, time that, you know, this, uh, the way that the, the teams were split and the responsibilities were, were different uh, created a problem in terms of um, working and, and de de delivering on the solution. And also, if you wanted to have um, security and quality software, uh, the direction had to come from, from the uh, upper management and they needed to believe in this and allocate resources and, and uh, um, set the direction. Otherwise, then uh, you would find some small pockets of excellence where people would, would develop secure software, but overall the enterprise would be at, at risk because this one isn't something, something that would get applied um, throughout. So the problems for small and large companies were pretty much the same. You had to uh, come up with security requirements uh, but then having come up with those security requirements, you had to figure out which ones to apply first and where. And when you allocated budget in the same way, you had to figure out and decide how you would prioritize the spending of that budget, you know, where and how to spend it. And effectively, this, the, the, the answer to these questions is, is uh, answered by having a assurance program that helps you um, focus on, on these activities and prioritize. So as Nadim mentioned, we've been using the Open SAM, the OWASP SAM project. So the uh, Open SAM project is, is a OWASP SAM project is a, a flagship OWASP uh, project. Now it's quite mature, uh, and it basically uh, is a software assurance maturity model and a framework that helps organizations uh, sort of formulate and implement their software security strategy. Cover. One of the th the maturity. Sorry, let me jump in here, Kaveh, and just uh, I want to summarize uh, the previous two slides because I think uh, they bring out the specific issues that we've noticed in most uh, situations where we've worked with customers. Uh, that if, if you're a small team, in the, pre in, in the older days, it was hard to do what you can't do today. And that's where we think you can capitalize on uh, the models that we see today in smaller teams uh, working together interactively and achieving what in the old days required a lot of uh, coordination and technology. Today that's available almost for everybody. Um, in, in specific, in the, in, um, in the previous two slides, Kave was, was showing the difference between uh, a small team that maybe didn't have the resources back in the day and then a new um, enterprise level team that had a lot of resources but they were divided up, they, they were siloed Everybody was working in their own world. The Unix guys on their own. The Windows guys, you have to raise a request for somebody to answer. So all, the, all these little walls inside that caused inefficiencies and therefore you had a lot of gaps and therefore vulnerabilities and security issues. And, and then this is, this is what this is leading up to. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Kav. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. So, so the Open SAM, um, uh, the Wolf SAM project basically allows you to um, fundamentally figure out what you need to do and also it helps you understand where you are with respect to your software assurance um, practice and where you need to go from that. So uh, uh, OWASP SAM uh, identifies four business functions. These are governance, construction, verification and operation. And then it, and this, these, these um, business functions are things you must do if you're in the 
uh, software development uh, uh, world, and then it breaks down each of these um, business functions into uh, sub practices. Um, so three practice for each one, uh, and each of these then uh, has different three different uh, maturity models. So and it's this this, this different maturity levels that allows you to figure out where you are and where you need to go with respect to your software assurance uh, um, um, program. So and it's not uncommon for, for an organization to be a maturity level uh, you know, two or three in their um, design review phase, for example, as part of the verification, um, while they are uh, maturity level zero for their um, you know, uh, strategy and metrics maybe in, in, in the governance. So, so this, this is a fairly um, comprehensive um, framework for you to, to look at what is the state of the art in terms of software assurance and, and then try to uh, marry up your practices to those described by uh, the OWASP SAM project. So um, if I just briefly go back to the point that Nadim just made about how in, in the enterprise you have these different uh, silos and you know, the people who build uh, the project and the people who operate it and the people who maintain it are, are, are often separate. Um, this unfortunately is still the case in many organizations. So I still do, uh, with Nadim, we do some consulting for, for large enterprises and it's not uncommon for us to see this situation still in, in, in operation. However, this is something that people are aware of and they're trying to fix it and, and this, the solution for that is basically DevOps, which is to try to bring the, the people responsible together and then add automation to that to, to make that the glue and the, 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 the workflows work much better and simpler to, uh, to do that. So this is something that obviously I'm sure you've all heard of and are practicing most likely. And this, this helps us in, in, in uh, looking at how we can then layer security on, on top of uh, uh, the, the, the assurance model. So if you look at the, uh, the different uh, business functions and the practices underneath, then uh, the three items to the right, the construction, verification, and operation, these are basically the activities that are, in, are involved in development and operations, which is, which is DevOps. And, and what uh, um, people have tried to do now is to basically uh, create DevSecOps, which is DevOps with its integration of, of and, and close coordination of the teams uh, and the automation, but adding security to that uh, uh, automation. So you have, you know, uh, in addition to your unit testing, which allow you to have that CI/CD pipeline, you have now automated security testing as well. That right. will check to see that your application is not only functioning we have a, uh, correct, Kabe, we have a but question. also. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, uh, for enterprise organizations, uh, which team should be responsible for the implementation of uh, compliance with, with SAM or uh, in the enterprise? Is it a development team, compliance team, security assurance? What's your recommendations? Uh, is who really holds the responsibility for implementing the open SAM model entirely or is it yeah. just yes yeah and and that's a good question because uh, as you can see there's a lot of roles and a lot of things that have to interleave so it can't come up it can't be a grassroots uh, approach it can't come up from development it has to be understood by management and be done in, in sort of a, a an integrated and top-down sort of approach. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kaveh, but I think that's, that's sort of what we're seeing. Um, you need guidance, you need sort of an overall strategy, you need governance, you need policies. Without these, then it'll happen individually. Maybe the governance team? I mean, who led the, 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 the exercise? Which team? GRC team, maybe? Um, Leading the exercise, so I wouldn't say governance. It, it depends what the governance team does. We've noticed that in different organizations, different, the same role might mean different things. And it's a matter of understanding the organization and their dynamics, and then finding the key people who can help roll out the strategy. Um, 
So I, it, it's not a straightforward answer, but um, I mean, Kaveh, if, if you have something to add. Yeah, I'm not sure if I heard the second question, but uh, yeah, I think it's something that needs to be done at, to, to, to get uh, software assurance to be rolled out at the organization level and not sort of at, at sort of these pockets of excellence, then, then it needs to be done, uh, you know, f from, from, from the, the management need, need to drive it. With respect to whether governance is where you start or where, um, you know, other places where you start your adoption of software assurance, your software assurance program, that can, that can vary. So, for example, you might stipulate that all uh, applications that you develop must go through uh, static application security testing, wherever that, that applies. And, and in, in that initial phase that you're, you're, you're doing this, you may not even require people to do anything with the results. All you're doing is you're, you're getting visibility into the risk, and then you may use that visibility into the, the, the vulnerabilities that the static analysis tools identify to then to drive the training aspect and say, well, we've found, I don't know, 50,000 SQL injection vulnerabilities in our code. Um, findings, sorry, and maybe 10% of that are, are actual um, uh, uh, exploitable vulnerabilities. But what this suggests to us is that we need to improve our training with respect to SQL injection. So we'll roll out uh, some training to, to the developers and, and do that. So it, I think the, the thinking needs to be done uh, at a higher level. But in terms of how you begin your implementation and the rollout, it can happen at different layers within within the business functions or under practices underneath. Does that answer your question? Yep, yep, thanks. Great, so, um, so uh, j taking a step back, we were just talking about how uh, DevSecOps then tries to layer security testing on top of um, your, your DevOps uh, pipelines. And so what I'd like to do, Nadim, if it's okay, I'll hand it over to you to um, to talk, talk this through, and then uh, just let me know when you want me to. Uh, yeah, thank you. You know, go go up this line. So, so this is a typical sort of DevSecOps um, uh, pipeline or sort of a cycle that we will tr will find most teams working with, um, and it, it sort of uh, represents. You know, you you have some user stories that you're going to create. So you have features or change requests or something that the business wants to do. And that's where you start the planning. I, th I think, th sorry, the, the lighting is not making the colors look really proper. So in the middle there, that's plan, right? And let me point it out. Uh, and that's basically us collecting maybe the user uh, experience that we want, the features that we want the system to expose for our users, and to sort of have an idea of what we will build. The next step is you throw it over to the development team. They figure out how, the, how they'll develop this. Uh, they write the code. Uh, they, they, they commit stuff into their Git repository. Uh, that kicks off maybe a build process that takes place. You end up with some binaries, perhaps, or something that's ready for consumption. And that goes out to testing. Maybe you have some integration testing that's going to take place, or pot potentially some manual user testing. One of those things will happen. Then you start the release process. If you're happy with uh, the results, you start pushing it out to production, uh, which means you deploy it to wherever it's going to be running. Uh, you let that sit out there for a while. People are operating or using the software. And eventually, um, you get some feedback. So you monitor how things are going in, in production, how things are running. And then you get some feedback. Now you have new features or some fi bugs to fix, and you start over. So what we've done is, um, on the next set of slides, is we try to superimpose what OpenSAM would require you or would, could have as touch points when considering uh, those different stages. So we go to the plan stage, and what does OpenSAM tell you? OpenSAM tells you, well, define security requirements. Now, it's, it's confusing, especially with big companies. The word requirements can mean a million things, so you have to be very careful and very specific about what you uh, mean there. In, in our case, with OpenSAM, we mean uh, user stories or security user stories or functional requirements for security within the application. Uh, the other um, definition that you might end up having people mean when they say security requirements is you're testing uh, 
requirements. Like, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to run a pen test now? This is a requirement from the business for you for, as in security. Uh, so try to distinguish when you have these conversations with customers uh, about which one they mean. Right? In the plan phase, we mean the user stories. We mean the backlog, the items that are going to go for development to develop and which have a security aspect to them. Right? Um, now, to, to build those user stories, uh, you could first resort to maybe regulatory requirements, uh, compliance documents to say, well, uh, any customer data is, is encrypted, for example. So that's, that's an easy requirement that you can just push into the backlog and make sure that uh, developers know that this will happen. Uh, but then, sorry, can we go back one, one slide, Kave? Uh, but then, what if we want to systematically know if there are uh, aspects of the system that need s special care? How do we find those out? That's when you start playing the uh, security hacker sort of pen tester role by looking at your application and trying to threat model it. You think about the components uh, that are delivering the value of your software, and then you think how, about how it will fail or how it could fail, and then think about the controls that need to be in place. And then those controls are now user stories that need to end up in your backlog. And, and that's how you can sort of repetitively do this afterwards. So let's say this is the end of a cycle, you have some feedback, now you can use that feedback to uh, decide on what new controls you need. Um, okay, and so next we go to the code uh, step. Um, traditionally, you'll have some repository where your code is being committed. Uh, some, some, I think on some of the sessions we talked uh, earlier about uh, static analysis tools, having uh, coding check uh, style checkers in our IDEs while, while developing so you could find the issues as you develop your code rather than wait for later. Um, also looking at the dependencies. So if we're using a lot of op open source software, we're pulling libraries that we didn't write, uh, just like a person was talking about earlier with the NSA tool. Um, he says compile it so you know what's in it. The same, the same thing goes for your own code. If you're using Maven to build your, your projects, you're pulling in code or you're pulling in libraries that were potentially compiled elsewhere uh, and put there on publicly. Um, so you, you would potentially, as part of your OpenSAM strategy, have your own local repository and only libraries that have been vetted, that have been checked for security issues or that you built yourself are checked into that artifact library and uh, repository. And then anybody who's developing code in your organization is pull pulling these uh, dependencies from a trusted source, from a local source rather than from outside the company. Um, other things like containers and Im images that also you might be pulling from outside, again, think about, well, no, we should have our own local trusted repository. We use that rather than uh, the outside stuff. Uh, next, we go to the build step, which is where a lot of the uh, integration of tools can be uh, used, uh, like the static analysis tools, like code quality checkers, um, SonarCube, for example. Um, pass and fail is not necessarily this step, but uh, it, it's, it was just a point to, to bring this up. Uh, when you're thinking about your pipeline or you're thinking about you're building your product or solution, uh, you have security policies to meet, right? Uh, we don't want to release code that has critical vulnerabilities. So a check in our pipeline might say, if SAS produces a critical vulnerability, says there is a critical vulnerability in my code, then break the build now. Don't, don't even go to integration testing. Don't go to pre-releasing and all that. Uh, send it back to development. They have to fix it. Then we run the process over and over. So you want to fail fast, fail early, shifting left, right? Um, the other things you might think about is, well, what we had like 100 user stories that were compliance-based. Uh, were they all developed in this release? If not, okay, to, do we have exceptions to go live without these compliance stories being implemented? Um, Third-party dependencies we talked about, so again, uh, you don't want to be pulling in things that you know are vulnerable already. Um, so this is another step in your build process that could basically fail the build at that point. And then potentially if you've passed everything, you, you move on to the next stage where you could also fail. So you, you keep putting checks within your, uh, your process, your pipeline, to make sure by the end you've done as much sort of due diligence and uh, testing and assurance activities to, to be confident in the output that you have. Um, 
so the test phase is when you have something you can really test. You can run a dynamic analysis tool or do burp or app scan or web inspect or any one of those things. Uh, run the QA scripts. QA scripts are a really good place to think about, well, we had security user stories. Did we develop QA scripts for those? Can those be used by our uh, dynamic testing tools to increase coverage of our scanning? Um, can we use hybrid analysis, you know, running an agent that will report back to the scanning tool, tell it, well, this kind of exception happened on the back end, but you didn't see it. Uh, so th that, that's where the testing uh, step would sort of touch closely to the OpenSAM activities. Uh, next, we go to the release, which is where, oh, okay. So I think this one was an example of, uh, I think uh, it was Sharif who, st who talked about the flow of development within your repository. You have a develop branch, you have a master branch that represents anything in production. You have a develop branch where people are developing new features. And then out of that, you're, you have a feature branch. And then it's not clear on this slide, but potentially before a feature is uh, merged back to develop, you want to run some tests on it. You run the unit tests, you run the static analysis tests. Uh, this passes, you merge, you run in staging. In staging, you run your QA scripts, you run your dynamic testing, you run anything else you feel necessary when you have something that's uh, uh, binary and running live. And then finally, it passes everything. You go to master and you go live. Uh, so next slide, release. That's pretty much you collecting all the assurance activity logs and records that show that you've done your job and you hash maybe the binary so that you know this is the binary that matches this testing. So you have collective evidence that shows you've done what your homework. Uh, any exceptions or approvals, again, you record them at this point. Next, we go to the monitor, uh, to the deployment. Uh, at this point, uh, you might be running something like runtime protection instrumentation solutions that will maybe detect if something is bad is happening, report it to you. Uh, you identify if your baselines are up to date, you know, they're secure. You're, if you're using containers, Docker, and so on, are we pulling in um, uh, Images that are secure, at least don't have any known vulnerabilities. Uh, finally, and I think that's been touched upon by other people as well, in the end of the day, you can only do so much, and the rest is you have to damage control. You have to have a strategy that thinks about, I'm probably already penetrated at some point. I'm, I'm already um, vulnerable, or someone is already in the system. Uh, how to reduce that damage, how to not notice bad things happening, and to have a plan uh, to handle incidents. Finally, uh, we get to the operate, which is where all this stuff comes into action. So being able to roll back, being able to um, respond to an incident and uh, elevate to whoever. Hello. Yeah. Whoever is basically responsible to help uh, escalate or move a, uh, an incident along. Um, and finally, we get to monitoring, which is w where y uh, I think a lot of places I've seen ha haven't yet integrated this bit. So the application layer plugging into the SOC and having use cases that consider the context of their applications within the environment, within the organization, and then, su and then acting upon those. Um, the last thing would be people think, oh, we're done. We, everything passed. We're good now. No. Um, today, we don't have this CVE. Tomorrow, we do. Have we checked that everything that's running live is now not vulnerable because of that CVE? Um, our, our infrastructure, our operating systems, our uh, dependencies on libraries, our own code, we now have maybe a new rule in our static analysis tool. Uh, so we need to run these continuously, even if we've passed all the tests. The time is changing, the technology is changing, so we need to continuously test. And I think over to you, Kave. Uh, yeah, so uh, just, just going back to look at uh, what we've covered so far, then we, uh, uh, Nadim has talked about the DevSecOps now, uh, which covers the construction, verification, and operation. And then uh, we, we need to then look at governance. So uh, our use case for this is that we, we have, we're working with a, a startup in the fintech uh, area. And uh, Nadim and I have worked with them to try to help them uh, 
adopt you know DevSecOps in their uh, development pipeline. Uh, however, the governance side is is of particular importance for them because uh, they can only get their banking license if if they're shown to be uh, you know pass their audit and show that they can, they're compliant with the regulations that apply to uh, to to their industry. So. Um, having a look at what uh, the different um, practices that uh, OWASP SAM identifies, you have strategy and metrics for governance, policy and compliance, and education and, and guidance. So um, looking at strategy and metrics, some of the more important, uh, in my opinion, uh, activities are uh, you know, build and maintain, maintaining a, an assurance program roadmap. This is mainly to say, look, this is where I am. That's where I want to go, and these are the phases that I want to, the steps that I are going, I'm going to take to, to approach that uh, ideal um, situation. There is uh, the activity of classifying data and applications based on, based on business risk, and that's the risk rating model, which I'll come back to uh, momentarily. Uh, and then uh, it's the question of uh, conducting periodic industry-wide cost comparisons and collecting metrics. And this is, this is in a way, to to understand where you are within your vertical with respect to your spending and your uh, security activities. So, for example, um, uh, I don't know, um, RBS in Royal Bank of Scotland is spending 100 million a year on their security program, and Barclays is spending 500. Then there might be a situation that uh, RBS are uh, sort of underspending on their security, and they need to um, review what. With respect to the risk rating model, so this is a key um, uh, um, metric that uh, helps uh, organizations focus their uh, efforts on, on, the, on the most important um, aspects of their security. So we mentioned before where uh, you know, you've got your requirements and you've got your budget and now you want to fix the, the issues. And now you have to basically pick uh, the most vulnerable uh, applications or the most critical applications to, uh, to fix. And how do you do that? And that's basically by um, developing a risk rating model that's uh, relevant to your uh, organization and input into that for example, the criticality of the application function to the business. So if it's generating revenue for the business, if it's uh, providing dashboarding to executives that allow them to make decisions about how to proceed with with the strategy, then this might make it an ethical application from, from that respect. The type of data that's handled by the application is important. If it's um, credit card information, if it's uh, personally identifiable information, if it's transaction data, uh, like SWIFT transactions and so on, again, that might be something that uh, sets it apart from, from other applications. And then uh, at the attack surface, whether it's internet spacing and how much control you have over uh, the way that the application can be accessed. And, and there, there are other questions as well, but the risk rating model is, is a deterministic um, model where you can actually take this input for your application and come out with uh, the, the actual rating of your application. This is something that will change over time as the application evolves and needs to be revisited. But it's important to, to be able to categorize your applications into this different, uh, the different ratings so you can then decide how you're going to prioritize your your, your time on, 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 uh, on, on, on the security activities. The education and guidance that the OpenSAM describes um, suggests that you should uh, educate your uh, employees. Uh, the ideal situation is to um, do security training based on their roles. And so you, you will, you will uh, train the developers differently to uh, from a security perspective to the QA testers, to the architect, and, and, and so on. And there is a variety of, uh, of vendors who provide this kind of uh, role-based tra security training. Um, uh, so you have structured computer-based training, you have instructor-led ones, uh, gamified training, or certifications that your employees can, can apply for and, and maybe be by the organization so that they can prove that they are qualified and not carry out the tasks that they're, they're, um, they need to do. So from, uh, then there's the guidance. So this is where the organization comes up with policies, standards, procedures, and, and, and guidelines. 
Um, now, in this regard, policies are important because they're high-level directions about how the uh, organization wants to approach their security goals. Um, I've been to places where uh, organizations spend a lot of time in tr coming up with very specific standards, procedures, and guidelines about which, for example, which um, encryption algorithms you can use, which kind of hashing algorithms are, are good, specific guidelines for logging in C++ or in Java, etc. And in my experience, what I've seen is that while these begin as, as very relevant and, and good uh, um, documents, uh, it's very hard to keep these up to date, and they very quickly become outdated and, and basically no longer relevant. So another approach that might be worth following is to, to try to invest in tooling that enforce and implements and validate, validates the adherence to industry standards. Now, they might be um, not as stringent as you, you want, but uh, they are likely to be more, um, remain more up to date and valid. Obviously, unless you're like the NSA or something like that, where you, you, you will have your own and, and maintain them. But in general, I think that's my, my experience being that uh, the more um, uh, specific ones end up being, being outdated. So um, in, in our use case, the, the, uh, the, the bit that we're particularly interested in trying to help our customer uh, deal with is this sort of policy and compliance. And, to, if you, and this, this, this element of SAM is, uh, or SAM is focused on trying to identify risks. So you have, um, if you take the use case of regulatory compliance, uh, you, know, you need to see which regulations apply to your organization. And um, so in this case, it might be GDPR or PCI DSS. And so naturally, you need a compliance register to be able to store uh, the, the list of um, uh, regulations that, that apply to your, to your uh, uh, organization. And then you, the next question is, which applications need to be GDPR compliant? And so therefore, you need an application register that maintains uh, all of the applications, what kind of data they, ac they access, um, which countries they operate, to, operate in, so that you can then try to decide whether GDPR compliance is something that they need to have or, or, or not. And then what does GDPR compliance actually mean? So this requires somebody to uh, read the, the document, the regulation, um, interpret the, the requirements that are in there, and then convert these user stories that they can be added to the backlog of the applications that are, are in scope. And then there will be a situation where there will be applications that, for whatever reason, are not compliant with these uh, regulations. And for that, then you need a risk register. So these are uh, specific. And, I, and I've been to places where these uh, registers are effectively um, Excel sheets that, that people maintain. Uh, and then there is the um, uh, industry and organization-specific policy compl uh, compliances that, that you can treat in the same way. But where, where we find there is a gap is basically in the automation of, of this sort of understanding the regulation requirements understanding which applications are um, um, in scope and, and, and uh, trying to apply those things. So looking at, for example, quantifying and, and treating the risk, you, know, you, you need the risk rating model to tell you uh, the, the criticality of the, of the application so that you can focus on, on uh, f fixing those first. You will have policies and processes that determine how you actually treat the risks so, for example, you want to, um, for critical applications, you want to make sure that an application that's critical uh, uses a DevSecOps pipeline that applies you know, dynamic application security testing and static application security testing as part of the pipeline. And your policy is that we will not go to production if we've got any uh, critical vulnerabilities identified by these testing tools. And then, you know, obviously, then you still want to uh, Register these in the risk register if the policies are violated and for some reason you're not able to, to mitigate the risk. So, for example, and it might be an, an example situation might be where an open source um, component has a vulnerability uh, and your upgrade path to fix that is not something that you can do, uh, you know, immediately. And for that, then you know your risk risk officer may need to. Um, to accept the risk or, or decide whether the application is, is, is taken offline. 
So um, the automation gap from our perspective is that, especially around policy and compliance, um, most of these requirements are often expressed in documents. And the awareness of the process and the requirements is then quite poor, and the adherence is equally poor. So I've been to places where they've had very robust and, and comprehensive uh, policies and, and, and compliance requirements. And what this has meant was, has been um, you know, days and weeks of uh, uh, consultants arranging meetings uh, with you know, uh, development teams in different regions where they, in, they read the documents to them, they explain to them what the processes are and what they need to do uh, so that they can actually do that. And, and then as soon as this um, documents change, then this process needs to be uh, re re repeated. So uh, our goal basically is to uh, try to automate this. Um, what we've tr looked at is try to use these uh, low-code application platforms to create uh, the compliance application risk and data register so you can create forms and, and backing um, stores for, th for these, these items quite easily in these low-code application platforms. Uh, we want to distill the regulatory requirements into user stories that we can then automatically add to the backlog of, of, of the applications that are in scope and try to automate the processes uh, using workflows and rule engines and integrate those into uh, the governance uh, uh, all, uh, those governance uh, touch points into the DevOps activities. So we're at a fairly early stage of doing this. Uh, so we're prot prototyping the basic workflows. We're using GDPR as an initial compliance regulation uh, to, to try to map the user stories. Uh, and these user stories may be common across different regulations, you know, how you treat um, data addressed or data in transit is a user story that might be a requirement from, from multiple regulations. So it's not something that it just expands. And then uh, uh, finally, we're evaluating these low-code platforms to see which of these work, which, which um, allow us to, to capture the workflows and do the integrations with the DevSecOps pipeline in the most nat natural way. Um, so uh, le let me just uh, play a, a, a brief video of what, how we we're hoping that this will work and then just uh, open up the So, so Kaveh, let me just uh, re-emphasize that last bit. We, what we hope to do is together to sort of uh, start an OWASP project where uh, we take the open SAM and we make it easier for companies to adopt. Right now it's basically read the standard or read the framework and then you're on your way. You start figuring out how you'll do it. Uh, but in a lot of places where we've gone, it's almost just uh, a place that's starting up and they need to implement it. And it's almost going to always be the same uh, pattern of a few things that you need to have uh, already um, set up, like a data register that says, well, these are the data types that we use. We use customer information and so on. Uh, you need to have an application register. So these things are pretty basic. Um, you don't really need to wait and, uh, and, and do it or design it differently for different customers. And that's what we hope we can uh, achieve using those low-code platforms that um, Kaveh just mentioned, systems that basically are workflow uh, um, designing tools that you can just design the workflow in and say, here, start, uh, and you're on your way. Uh, great. So this is an animation that uh, Nadine briefly put together, and it shows where the workflow should allow a, a product owner to uh, uh, decide that they want to create an application and go through the workflow, which says, you know, the new application registration, uh, the application is placed in the application register, forms uh, follow to request the, the product owner to describe the, the different types of data that the application is going to, to operate on. Um, the data protection officer will then review these and assign uh, tags that, you know, such as you know, PII, personally identified information, which will then determine which regulations apply to, to, these, to this um, application. We're actually thinking of doing this in a slightly different way to, to the animation, but, but it, 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 it demonstrates the idea. And then once it identifies the different uh, uh, compliance user stories that, that apply to this particular application, these are then integrated automatically and, and pushed into the backlog of the application. And they, they, these, these backlog items will have 
uh, will allow us to see that these are compliance tags to see if, if the issues that, that, that make up these, uh, the, the resolution of these um, items, if they're, um, if they're completed, then uh, the, the compliance uh, uh, regulation has been, um, requirements have been met, or they have not, in which case the application would be uh, put in the, in the risk register. So um, there, is, there is some manual uh, uh, steps involved. The interpretation of a particular user story and the mapping of that into sub um, issues that or tasks that need to be done in the application is something that again needs to be handled in the sprint planning sessions. But but the the overall kind of uh, backlog item and, and and its resolution will be should be handled automatically. Thanks, Kaveh. Uh, so thank you very much for 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 your time. Uh, but that's. Uh, the end of uh, kind of what we wanted to talk about, and perhaps we can open it up if there's time to a uh, question and uh, answers. And, and actually, we, we would really appreciate your feedback in terms of your experiences and, and whether you think this is a, 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 there are alternatives or, or this is a viable way of, uh, of approaching the governance piece. Thanks. Questions? Uh, please. Okay, uh, so I, I, okay. Uh, so my point was not to develop the dependency, it was just to own the dependency repository. So uh, if you're using Maven, you can actually host a, a Nexus repository locally, and then when you're fetching the jars, they're coming from a local installation of Maven, for example, or Nexus. Uh, that way you, you are controlling what the developers are using. If we sit and we say, oh, we're only, you're allowed to use the XML parser library and you're also allowed to use, I don't know, um, let's say a logger, Apache logger, commons logging or whatever. One jar file that we all agree is fine and there's no major CVE issues about it. Then we check it in, we check the, those jars, the ones that we are comfortable with, uh, locally. We build them and put them locally and then the developers or the other teams in the in the organization, they pull that version of the jar. They don't go out to Maven Central to download a, a version that you don't control. You don't actually, so one of the things you would actually disallow any build server from going outside of the network. You bring them the things you approve of locally and they build locally. So you try and like, like uh, Mr. Sorry, uh, Azadine, sorry, I, I uh, was mentioning earlier, like the tool from the NSA, uh, if you got it from the internet, it was backdoored. It had a backdoor in it. But if you downloaded the source and you build it locally, uh, you, you can trust it. At least somebody has reviewed it and you have the code local. Yeah, I think also, for example, if you have your local uh, nexus or, or repository, then uh, if you are, for example, in the UK, there was a very high profile breach of uh, one of the credit rating agencies called Equifax. And that was because they were using uh, a, um, a vulnerable version of, of, of Strut. Now, it, it, the discovery process of trying to understand whether uh, once the CVE is, is, is made public, the discovery of, of whether you, you have a dependency on uh, struts, uh, then it can be one of going to every development team and asking, are you using struts in, in your application? Is it this version? Which can be a, a very time consuming and, and uh, problematic uh, uh, process versus going to your Nexus repository or your artifactory and looking to see if there is any footprint of that particular version of struts in there, and then you, you, you immediately know that your, your, your enterprise is exposed without having to go to each individual team to understand whether, whether that's now. Of course, you still have some further discovery to do, but um, you, you, you have an immediate answer without having to go and, and look at things uh, in, in, and, and ask uh, lots of different teams for answers they may not be able to give you immediately. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, it's, it's not a question, it's just a remark. The, the term uh, DevSecOps is a new term, and we don't know if this term is, uh, will be the new term used if in the future. Maybe it's uh, DevOpsSec, maybe it's Sec DevOps. We don't know. What do you think? 
Musaimed. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty relevant to apply the DevOps culture in uh, the, the, the open SAM model and you, in assurance uh, in the software development lifecycle. So that, that's for sure. What they name it, uh, it's up to the community, I think. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you for your attendance, everybody. Thank you, Kabe. Thank you, everyone. Aware and GDPR day. Uh, so, what, what is GDPR? Does GDPR affect us here in Egypt? Is anyone aware? Oh, uh, regulation uh, uh, similar to GDPR uh, will be applied in Egypt. And, I mean, is GDPR even relevant to us? From what I understand, like if, if you're working in an organization where um, maybe this organization has like um, other maybe branches in Europe or something, uh, probably you'll be affected by GDPR. Absolutely. So if you're a, a service provider to a company in Europe, uh, then the company is bound to make sure that you are GDPR compliant or they, they will have to stop working with you. So that, that's, that's true. Thank you, everyone.